So let's finish and thank the audience and to our speakers that they were willing to come to Prague and talk. I think it was a very interesting panel and uh, full of very interesting suggestions and questions to be solved in later panels. So thank you. towards multilateralism, right? So the reaction was this, you know, what is going on? What should we do with multilateralism? What is go going on? What are the reforms that are needed, et cetera, et cetera? But if we look at the very basic, the very, very basic rationale and the theory or the philosophy behind multilateralism, we basically see that um, uh, it's about the fact that there are some common challenges and common threats to nation states around the globe, right? and that these threats and challenges pose collateral damage to states and have spillover effects to everyone involved, right? So this was the idea already in the 1920s when the League of Nations was, was created. But very soon we realized that we don't, as a common, uh, as a co um, common group of states in the globe, we don't realize or we can't agree so much on what is common and what is a threat, right? And at the same time, one of the promises of multilateralism is that basically there will be equal rewards for all states involved in multilateral decision making. And now this is also being challenged, right? This equal awards of multilateralism in the economic sphere, economic sphere in security, in energy security, right? So these are the topics, obviously, that uh, we would like to cover throughout this, uh, this panel. And uh, having in mind that there are many perspectives on multilateralism, not just the Trump administration's, not the, just the EU's uh, of perspective, but we should look at also the perspective from other regions of the world. And that's why our panel, let's say, is, uh, has representatives from all around the globe, which will help us look at the question of the future of multilateralism, because if we are to have some kind of a multilateralism uh, in the future, it really has to be multilateral, right? If it is to work, it cannot be unilaterally imposed, right? It has to be multilateral. So, without further ado, and you did not come here to listen to me, but uh, to the panelists, I would, uh, we're going to stick to the, uh, uh, to the program and go in the order of uh, the program. But before that, uh, let me introduce uh, all of our speakers. On my left hand, we have Alan, uh, Alan Chong, who um, is Associate Professor and Acting Head of the Center of Multilateral Studies at the, at, uh, at the RSIS of Nanyang Technological University in uh, Singapore. Uh, on my right hand, we have Joe Siracusa, uh, Professor of Human Security and International Diplomacy at the Royal uh, Melbourne Institute of uh, Technology, Australia. He is also the president of Australia's uh, Council for the Humanities, Arts, and Scientists. And uh, sciences. Uh, on my further left hand, I ha we have uh, John Cloud, who is professor in the National Security Department of the U.S. Naval War College. He has uh, 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 abundant experience in the U.S. Uh, Foreign Service as he served there for 32 years, uh, being ambassador to Lithuania and also working in missions in, in Warsaw, Berlin, and the, and the EU. And Furthest uh, uh, to my left, we have uh, Matt Brown. He's currently head of the Department of International Le Relations and European Studies at the Metropolitan University in Prague, and formerly uh, also an IIR uh, researcher. Okay. So, without further ado, I would give the floor to Alan, who has a few slides for us also. All right, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for coming to this final panel. Uh, I offer you a perspective of multilateralism from Singapore and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Uh, it is not foolproof, and uh, as you can see, this is a very complex endeavor, and I'm glad to have heard uh, our keynote speaker's remarks this morning. And after my presentation, you might realize that the Visegrad 4 has a lot in common with Asia-Pacific multilateralism. Okay, next slide, please.
Okay, this is the, depending on your imagination, the alphabet soup or the spaghetti bowl of Asia-Pacific multilateralism. Uh, this was drawn by the Center for Strategic and International Studies uh, in Honolulu, and it accurately captures what's going on in the Asia-Pacific. Uh, you might say that this is actually the formula for stability in the sense that no great power is ever left outside the framework. And if you think about the idea of peer pressure as a diplomatic tool for socializing great powers, this is basically it. Uh, there's no great power that does not want in on all these overlapping parties, if I may use the, the analogy loosely. Uh, and what's unique is that uh, we try not to uh, prefigure certain uh, states in the Asia Pacific as pariah. Uh, even North Korea, however controversially it might be regarded by uh, the United States as the outlier, is treated as closely associating partner by the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. It's even signed up to the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, which is basically this uh, seemingly clinical statement that we are all peaceful neighbours. Uh, so that makes North Korea part of this uh, scenario even. All right? Now, what's happening today, okay, and this is my only substantive slide, is that we have this picture of multilateralism whereby there are plenty of centrifugal trends, okay? trends which appear to be tearing apart multilateralism, but at the same time, it will not break. Okay? This is like uh, a, a piece of carpet, or if you prefer the politically incorrect term, a piece of plastic that can infinitely be stretched, but it will never break, because it is basically made of that kind of material, not necessarily robust, but because it is inclusive. All right? Now, what's happening with the great powers? Uh, I'll talk about the main polar competition between the United States and China. Now, this China under President Xi has actually adopted a more unilateralist foreign policy. This is from the perspective of all the other states in the Asia Pacific. This is a sharp departure from the previous presidents of China where they've just adopted shades uh, of difference from the original Deng Xiaoping model of uh, avoiding the limelight and strengthening the country quietly, engaging collaborative partnerships with all of Asia and so on. This president appears to actually embrace multilateralism when it suits him, and it's very selective in implementation. And from time to time, uh, the current president in China does not seem to speak up loudly enough in favor of multilateralism. So that's a problem. And you see how this is consistent with the nationalist rhetoric which he has used in foreign policy. Uh, when you look at Beijing's uh, activities in the South China Sea, the militarization of whatever Beijing controls, as well as putting pressure through military uh, measures, exercises, gunboat diplomacy-like actions towards the other claimants, uh, it undermines China's uh, image as uh, a constructive superpower in Asia. And along the border with India, there are also constant flare-ups. So this is the situation. And of course, you know, uh, Beijing has cleverly played the terrorism card in relation to its domestic uh, issues of insurgency, unrest, and so on. So this appears to be a great power that's bent on doing its own thing. In contrast, I shouldn't say in contrast, it's a matter of degree of difference. Uh, Donald Trump appears to have abandoned America's uh, seemingly historic role since 1945 of uh, stabilizing the Asia Pacific. Uh, we used to be able to count on American presidents since 1945, regardless of whether they're Democratic or Republican, to plant the American flag in favor of stability, accommodation, and whatever else the Southeast Asian nations wish for in terms of stability. And uh, most of Southeast Asia in particular has always counted on the fact that the Americans would uh, weigh the scales just a little subtly against China should China ever tilt the balance the other way. All right? uh, but all this is undermined under Donald Trump. What happens increasingly in the perception of Southeast Asian nations is that this is a great power willing to uh, apply show over substance. There's a huge erosion of trust and special treatment of allies. You realize that every country that's had 
uh, had and have special defense relations with Washington are finding themselves under pressure because all these things do not amount to any form of gravitas with the Trump White House. Uh, there is a tremendous amount of diplomatic procrastination and increasingly America does not appear to be a reliable balancer against China. Which brings me to the more detailed third point. Now, this is where I tap into those of you who are interested in the diplomacy of small states in relation to multilateralism on the security and diplomatic front. Now, what is ASEAN centrality? It is a club of weak states, essentially, weak in terms of military and economic power, who are saying to the great powers and to their like-minded uh, fellow uh, peers, look, let's make a virtue out of weakness. The great powers clearly are unable to find channels to talk to one another or to supervise uh, or, or to control their own rivalries. So let's offer them this uh, continued multilateral uh, you know, location. It, it need not necessarily be a physical location in a particular city, but nonetheless, by convening regular ASEAN summits or ASEAN-related summits, if we go back to the preceding slide, Okay, ASEAN is at the center uh, for a good reason because great powers, medium powers and so forth, they can usually trust a club of weak states not to provide any sense of one-upmanship uh, when they host a summit or some kind of uh, open-ended forum. That's where the neutral ground argument happens uh, or plays conveniently into two great powers' intention. They can say that, look, this club of weak states happen to have invited us, so let's talk about our differences. And in that sense, just by offering this venue uh, for open-ended discussions, uh, the weak states keep the peace, all right? So, uh, ASEAN centrality is uh, extremely important in this default mode. And if you look at the two big competing geopolitical visions, some of you who sat in for the BRI panel this morning might argue that the BRI was never about multilateralism. But uh, in the embrace, the discursive embrace of ASEAN, uh, it is treated as a serious multilateral creation. All right? So ASEAN is currently positioned in the middle between siding with China or siding with the United States. The United States has come up with this rival vision. It's not just the United States, actually, it's more like a condominium of Australia, Japan, India, and the United States, called the Free and Open Indo-Pacific, or FOIP. So ASEAN is trying to steer a middle ground in between, and uh, if you look at the latest statement, they call it the ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific, which is, again, a very clever discursive strategy indicating that ASEAN wants to sit in the middle between the BRI and the FOIP. And interestingly, the BRI was never mentioned in this document. It just says that if you look at the nature of economic, uh, maritime, and other kinds of interdependence between uh, the Indo-Pacific and the Asia-Pacific, right, ASEAN has to be in the middle, and we welcome collaboration across the entire Indo-Pacific region. So this is a statement which you might argue means nothing, translates into no tangible development goals or even significant diplomatic uh, you know, conclaves. But it's saying to all the great powers uh, that, look, you need ASEAN. Why? Because we're willing to be a broad church for all your designs and we're willing to walk with you on anything you propose. All right? So this is what's going on in terms of the value of ASEAN-centered multilateralism. It keeps the peace in a default mode by saying that we're open to all suggestions, okay, without siding with anybody. Now, finally, on the political economy front, uh, as speaker after speaker today, including the uh, Deputy Czech Foreign Minister has indicated, the international trading system is under threat. Uh, how is the Asia-Pacific coping? Now, you see a strange combination of the grassroots initiative. Uh, the TPP may be dead if you're sitting in Washington, Ottawa, uh, you know, on that part of the Pacific. It might appear dead. But uh, the initiative, ironically, comes from the Asian side of the Pacific Rim. Uh, the Asian states have basically said, look, the TPP has been in a negotiation for X number of years, we have political ballast, we have political momentum in terms of goodwill going forward. Why don't we save it? 
okay, even though we're all weak. China is not part of it, but Japan is. So in that sense, they've revived the TPP uh, in uh, a quasi-zombie-like fashion, but it still works in the meantime, called the Comprehensive and Progressive Partnership uh, for the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Again, it's a tongue twister, CPTPP. But this is the game uh, that's going on in terms of trade multilateralism. We are saving whatever we've gained under the pre-Trump years. All right? uh, and on top of that, the spaghetti bowl effect takes place. Uh, again, if you go back to the previous chart I showed you, the overlapping diagram with all the circles, uh, trade also resembles increasingly that. Uh, whatever free trade agreement that is signed bilaterally or trilaterally in the Asia-Pacific is often uh, made okay, deliberately consistent with WTO rules as well as uh, the rules of the CPTPP and so on. Uh, from time to time, all of these uh, trading states have uh, embraced some degree of uh, the grand scheme of the mega FTA. Uh, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, for instance, is talking about the world's biggest ever free trade area of the Asia-Pacific. Now, this is currently a pipe dream. But what is more tangible beyond the CPTPP is the RCEP, uh, again, Regional Cooperation for Economic Partnership. This one potentially brings in both China and India. Uh, now, the sticking point as to why there has been no grand signing of any document is the question of tariffs. Uh, all of these states want to protect domestic industries, especially agriculture. All right? In this regard, Singapore, of course, is willing to sign anything because we've got no significant agriculture at home to speak of. All right? uh, nothing to protect, essentially. Uh, but for the bigger and medium-sized states across the Asia-Pacific, uh, the RCPE, uh, RCEP is a serious commitment. So this is where it stands. Uh, at the end of the day, if you think about it, when the so-called post-World War II engines of multilateralism fail. Okay, I'm pointing at the United States here. Uh, you have to go back to China and India. Now, China, of course, is a wild card. India apparently has taken a leaf out of Trump in terms of populist politics, uh, considering what's happening in Kashmir at the moment. Uh, but having said that, uh, India still needs growth. China still needs growth. The middle classes need to be pacified. Uh, for domestic political reasons. And this is where uh, trade multilateralism has a domestic or what we might call a second level buy-in uh, effect. And, and this is something alluded to by uh, the Czech Deputy Foreign Minister during his lunchtime talk. And this is uh, where I think Asia-Pacific multilateralism has a lot going for it. Even if it is a halfway house, things are never quite completed in a Big Bang fashion. But the fact that the game is going on, the musical chairs keep going on, and the music ne never seems to stop, is I think uh, you know, a case of three cheers for multilateralism that's going on despite having half its life sucked out of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan. And now I would like to give uh, the floor uh, to John. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. And I want to thank the Prague Institute for International Relations for inviting me to join you. It is always a pleasure to be in this beautiful city and to remember the momentous events that happened here almost 30 years ago. I must begin with a disclaimer by telling you that the views I present today are my own and not those of the Naval War College, the U.S. Navy, or the U.S. government. We are clearly in a new period. Even the United States recognizes the new period. The U.S. national defense strategy notes this is a period not of unipolar moments or things like that, but of great power competition. And we have to figure out how to be most effective in this new and different world. With regard to multilateralism, I think it's easy to over-focus on the current administration. Um, if you compare President Obama to President Trump, you see very different approaches to multilateralism. President Obama had a basic rule to his staff that we did not want to deploy U.S. troops unless we had a Security Council resolution. Many times, even when we had a Security Council resolution, 
the global public opinion was not favorable to what happened, Libya as a case in point. But then we, did, we had an invitation from the Arab League. We had a Security Council resolution. Uh, we pursued that with our allies, with the U.S. taking a much smaller part than was traditional. But unfortunately, the outcome was not what any of us had intended. We also saw a similar action with Syria. Uh, when Assad crossed the red line, the supposed red line, uh, and there was no consensus to use military force, President Obama uh, took advantage of a proposal put forward by the Russians to remove what we thought were all of Assad's chemical weapons and to then um, try to improve the take that weapon away from his attack on his people. Unfortunately, as we all know, he maintained some chemical weapons capability. We saw it again in President Obama's decisions regarding the Paris Agreement, re regarding JICPOA, the uh, nuclear agreement with Iran, a number of things that have not stood as, as we've gone forward. Pres President Trump has taken a completely different approach, which is his prerogative as the American president. He has been less interested in multilateral organizations and has committed to taking a bilateral approach to issues facing the United States. At the same time, that doesn't mean he hasn't pursued some multilateral proposals. After his initial visit to NATO, there was great fear that he was not going to endorse Article 5. About two weeks after his visit, he endorsed Article 5. Earlier today, there was mentioning of the uh, WTO appellate body looking at a U.S. case against the European Union on Airbus. I found quite um, interesting that it was all being put in a negative vein vis-a-vis -vis the United States. This is a case, a case I worked for about 20 years of my diplomatic career where rather than imposing unilateral sanctions on Europe, we have gone to the WTO, we have sought the WTO's approval, and once a decision becomes public, a decision has been made, and there have been rumors in the newspapers about the decision, but once the decision is made public, then we will be able to act. But we have done it exactly by WTO rules, not in any unilateral fashion whatsoever, and in fact, the European Union has a case against the United States for Boeing, which is about four to six months behind the U.S. case. And if they are found that they can impose sanctions, I assume they will do so as well. So, in, you know, it is easy to assume that President Trump is always going to act in a non-multilateral fashion. He has shown that he looks at the options, and pursues the one he thinks will be most effective. He has also been hesitant to use U.S. force. He did launch cruise missiles after yet another chemical weapons attack in Syria, but he has not taken such action since that time. And with the, with the current situation with Iran in the Persian Gulf, he has been making very public that he is re resisting efforts to to use military force. So as, as I look at President Trump's action, I look at what he has said, uh, it, it leads me to think he's more likely to take a bilateral or a unilateral action than a multilateral action. Now we're in a propitious week. It probably would have been easier to make this presentation a couple days from now, since the UN General Assembly is beginning President Trump will give his speech, and we'll see what he has to say about multilateralism in that speech. I have no idea what he's going to say, so I'll look at it with great interest. If you look, though, that the, the, this competition of great powers is between the United States, Russia, and China, it's hard for me to find more multilateral instincts in the other two great powers. The, Russia brought down the uh, Intermediate Nuclear Force Treaty by its continued violations. 
The U.S. waited a considerable time before we withdrew from the treaty, after we had announced those violations in an effort to resolve them. There was no interest on the other side. And in doing so, they reinforced the views of some in the U.S. For example, our former national security advisor, John Bolton, that these multilateral efforts are designed to constrain the United States, but nobody else. You have to remember that in 2014, Russia also occupied Crimea and invaded eastern Ukraine, despite the commitments it had made in the OSCE agreement and the Bud Budapest Memorandum to respect Ukraine's borders. Um, Alan just discussed China. And of course, China is going to be a major player going forward and a major determinant of future multilateralism. To date, China has not been a major player in multilateral organizations. But its power in them is increasing. I mean, what role do we see China playing in the UN Security Council of the future? Will it continue to protect sovereignty as it has? We have also seen China's disregard for multilateral decisions. Its rejection of the South China Sea arbitration decision does not bode well for its acceptance of multilateral decisions that run against what it defines as its national interests. Another question concerning multilateralism will be how organizations like the European Union act in the future. Even with the unique history of multilateralism that the EU has, where the EU lives multilateralism every day in a, in a very laudatory fashion, we're seeing threats to its unity, and you know one has to question whether these 27 or 28 countries, and I say that number range because, well, the British have announced they are leaving. They have not left yet, so I'm not going to presume that until they do it. Will they continue to work together so as to provide another pole in our so seemingly multipolar world? There's another question I think we must ask when we look to the future of multilateralism. And this may be because I look at this from an American perspective. But is multilateralism a tool or a goal? When multilateralism was begun, the goal was liberal internationalism. And multilateralism was a tool to achieve liberal internationalism. Now we seem to have put multilateralism in and of itself as the goal. I would argue from an American perspective that we'll use the tools that are available as we think what will be most effective. And that so we won't rule out multilateralism if we can accomplish the purpose that way. Uh, we won't say we'll always use that if we know it won't succeed. The initial proposals for Libya that President Obama faced would have led to NATO planes overflying Benghazi as Gaddafi's soldiers destroyed Benghazi because they were not sufficient to protect the people as the UN Security Council in, uh, resolution envisioned. The part of the question on, on this uh, part was, you know, what do I see for the future? And I have to admit I don't have a crystal ball that tells me whether we will reform the existing system or not. We have players that have been there forever, such as China, such as Russia, playing roles they have not played recently. It's hard for me to anticipate how they're going to play that role. You may all want to tell me that we have the United States playing a very different role than it has played recently. So it's very hard to predict what the outcome will be. One area that I once worked on a bit was the composition of the Security Council and how we could make that composition more relevant to the 21st century. And what became very clear to me was there is no consensus at hand on that issue. And the United States is not the problem on that issue. Uh, there were other members of the Security Council who are not interested in letting the most obvious candidates in. So my prediction on that one is we'll continue to have a system with five permanent members 
and 10 rotating members by regions, and that hopefully this 10 rotating will bring in some of those new member states. The other thing I think we'll, we'll do as we try to reform the system is we'll try to find workarounds to make it work. In 2008-2009, we needed a broader organization to discuss the global economy than what was then the G8. We used the G20. That brought in most of the major players. It brought in the, the China, the India, Brazil, a great many of the, of the countries that are mentioned when we talk about changing the composition of the Security Council. So I think in a, perhaps in a classic American fashion, I would argue that we'll find pragmatic ways to move forward. Now, I readily recognize that many people will not be satisfied with this approach, would rather see changes to the rules to update the institutions. However, I think finding pragmatic solutions is a better outcome than just ignoring the changes. So as I said, I think multilateralism provides us a means to build consensus and to build legitimacy. The question I raised earlier as to whether it is a process or an outcome is an important one that we all need to think about. But we also need to recognize that we need to re-engage to get countries. If, if we believe in multilateralism, we're going to have to re-engage to get countries to understand why it is in their interest. Why sitting in interminable meetings, why going to six or seven different Asian organizations uh, is worth the effort to go to six or seven different organizations. I don't mean to pick on Alan, but since he just put up that wonderful chart explaining them, and since I used to cover APEC meetings for uh, the U.S. government, I remember that reality. We're got, you know, it's probably a generational thing where you have to reconvince people that this is in their interests. Because it's, a, it's frequently extraordinarily time consuming. So for those of us who believe in multilateralism, I think we're gonna to have to put in the time and work to convince people. But also put in the, explain to them why, is it a process, is it an outcome? Is going, I mean I think many well, I guess I won't go there. <laughs> I was thinking about uh, European heads of government and state going to European Council meetings. And I think some of them would wonder why they're doing that all the time. But that's a different issue. Uh, as, um, as Jan said, I spent a couple years of my life uh, working at the U.S. Mission to the European Union. I came to respect that organization very highly. Um, and I don't, I don't want to put in comments something that might appear negative. So I thank you and I look forward to any of your questions when we get to the question period. Thank you very much, John, for, for your insights. Uh, now uh, the floor is yours, Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Very happy to be here. And also a special thank to Jan for introducing my topic with a very nice description of the European Union in the sense that we brief uh, multilateralism every day, I think you put it as. Uh, and indeed, uh, for instance, Ian Manus argued that one of the f fun fundamental norms of the European Union would be about multilateralism indicating that EU's responses always would be about multi preferring multilateral solutions. But I will get to that point in a short while. We just briefly mentioned how I plan to structure my intervention here today. We received three quite challenging questions from a chair here previous to, to, to this session. And the first of these questions was about the nature of a contemporary situation, the question, are we at crossroads when it comes to multilateralism? So we'll first start by trying to articulate my view of how, how I view uh, this contemporary situation. Thereafter, we turn to the second question, which would be, 
I guess I'm invited here to talk about the European perspective, and I will mention something about regionalism in relation, European regionalism, that is, in relation to the more global liberal world order. And thereafter, thirdly, because I think I was also in the, invited here to say something about the Czech Republic in this broad context, I will try to narrow down and get to some points about the situation of the Czech Republic here. If we look at what is the situation for multilateralism we are witnessing, or what kind of crisis are we witnessing? I think there is a much easier answer to what kind of crisis than there are to the question of what to do with this crisis. I would say that the crisis is all about legitimacy. And this is perhaps nothing very strange by this this conclusion, but if you look at multilateral organizations, you have very limited possibilities of so-called input legitimacy, that is how citizens in democratic countries can have an actual influence over the agenda of multilateral organizations. And now this goes also for the European Union, even if the European Union would have come the farthest by the development of its supranational European Parliament, where citizens directly can elect their representatives. But still, we have a problem here of kind of having citizens directly shaping the agenda of these organizations. Okay, but why is that a problem at this very moment? Well, you can argue that multilateral organizations, including the EU, they have been able to rely on their performance, or what you could basically call the output-based legitimacy, that basically, if you deliver, you can keep people happy, and there is not really a problem and much, very much of a discussion regarding how much you can influence the agenda of these particular organizations. And, of course, we see the election of Mr. Trump in the United States, as well as the vote in the UK on leaving the European Union. Clear indications, but at least not all people do perceive the benefits of multilateralism and multilateral organization, including the broader global economic order. Uh, meaning that the question is here, I'm not going to discuss what was discussed in the previous panel to quite some degree about the actual economic outcomes, but we can conclude perhaps that the perceptions of not being uh, belonging to those who are winning on the system is there and it's a problem for the continuation of, these, uh, of multilateralism as such. If we look at the European Union, this is not a new discussion at all. In the EU, and among academics following, analyzing the European Union, there has been a discussion about the problem of legitimacy for several decades, and a debate which was increased increasingly, or had uh, kind of a, uh, escalated after the Maastricht Treaty in the early 1990s, and we had a lot of discussions about this in relation to the proposed constitutional treaties on 15 years ago, and the problem is here that it's very difficult to have an organization where you have a fixed goal and be open to a broad discussion to allow for citizens to have more of a say over the agenda. That is, you had some examples of this. For instance, uh, there was the Plan D of the European Commission uh, issued by Margaret Wallström as a commissioner in the early 2000s. And the question was how to enhance more of a dialogue to kind of get to the core of this legitimacy problem. But the problem of this dialogue was always that there wasn't really the possibility of making a change based on the dialogue. And how can you have a dialogue if the actual outcome of the dialogue is set from the beginning? And this is kind of one of the struggles with the legitimacy perhaps not only of the European Union, but when it comes to multilateralism more in general as well. I promise to come to the question about, about relationship between European regionalism and global multilateralism. Because the question is, what is happening with the European Union at this point then? Would the European Union be more inclined to 
select other options at the global level than to be the voice in favor of multilateralism. And of course, if we look at trade, it could be the fact that when the United Kingdom is leaving, if it is leaving, that we will lose one strong voice which has always been defending a free trade based agenda and basically we would see more or stronger voices subjecting more of kind of protectionism at the European and at the regional level. Because if we look at it more general perspective, regionalism versus global multilateralism, in particular if we speak about the economic global governance, my argument would be that regionalism has been kind of a building brick in organizing the system at the global level. But perhaps after the situation with Brexit, contemporary crisis, we would see uh, EU looking more inwards and perhaps favoring more different types of economic policies. We could, for instance, some analysts have noted how many times the incoming president of the European Commission in initial speeches has mentioned the world of the single market and reflect the fact that it has been mentioned very ra rarely lately, perhaps an indication of this. Getting to my final point here, not to take too much time, uh, I promise to say something about the Czech perspective here as well. Uh, when it comes to a broader legitimacy issue, of course, we can perhaps be happy by looking at the opinion polls. It seems that Czech support for European integration, at least, is rising. People are more and more supportive of organization, perhaps as a consequence of the Brexit crisis. On the other hand, the issue of Brexit and losing the UK as an ally when it comes to the view on the single market might be a potential challenge which could lead us back to where we started off this morning. I'm looking at Professor Fawn over there and the discussion about alliances within the European Union promoting uh, uh, an agenda more linked to fr uh, free trade single market. That is, the countries such as the Czech Republic, that are countries that actually need to kind of have good strategies for organizing partnership coalitions would be smaller countries. And we see that happening in the European Union at large. We have that handset, the, the new Hansa League, which is trying to stress uh, from a northern perspective the issue and the perspective of small states, stressing the perspective, the need of being open and also support from multilateralism in general. Um, I think I will stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. And last but not least, we have uh, Joe Syracuse. <clears throat> Look, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here. And as Ronald Reagan used to say at my age, it's a pleasure to be anywhere. I was born on July 6, 1944, while Roosevelt was around, and Churchill, and Stalin, and Hitler, and before the atomic bomb. So I got to see the Cold War close up. I had my 40 books and 43 PhD students, so I got a real close look at everything. I was also a student in Vienna, and I've been resident in Australia for the last 45 years, so I'm a student of Australian politics. The discussion is multilateralism, and, and I begin it this way. President Trump has reminded the world the way Warren Harding reminded the world in the 1920s and Richard Nixon in the 1960s and early 70s reminded the world that there is no free lunch, okay? That is very clear. America had no permanent alliances between 1800 and 1949 for a particular reason. America was looking for a way to be involved in the world without being entangled. George Washington took note of that and every president since then has avoided that. I don't worry about uh, Donald Trump's tweets in the morning. A lot of that is just unfettered. And most people who get up at 3 o'clock in the morning do their business and go back to bed. I don't know what he's doing at 3 o'clock in the morning. Now look, Australia has been multilateral since its birth. It was a member of the British Empire. It fought in the First World War and lost 59,000 men out of a population of 4.9 million on behalf of the British Empire. In World War II, 
President, uh, our Prime Minister Menzies got on the wireless and told Australians, Britain is at war and therefore we are at war. Good evening. That was a one sentence thing about that war. And Australia has been involved in America's wars since then. Now, while Australia is multilateral to the core, and I'm talking about it belongs to everything, including one place that even invented the APEC, uh, uh, APEC arrangement in the 1980s. While it's multilateral to the core, it also calibrates its own national interest. If you want to know what Australia is all about, just look at the map. 12,500 miles of coastline, 5 million square miles, 30 surface ships, 6 submarines, only half of which work, and armed forces of 73,000 men and women. So Australia was always going to look for a great and powerful friend. Australia navigates between the multilateral world and the bilateral world of, its, of a, a great and powerful friend or a guarantor or a protector. After the British Empire fell apart in the early 1950s, it joined the United States through the ANZUS Treaty and has been a faithful ally ever since. Now, when Australia has to choose between its, multinational, or sorry, its multilateral obligations and its bilateral obligations, it tends to favor um, its bilateral obligations. I think what we have today, the crisis in Australia, is that the attitude towards the outside world, multilateral or bilateral, has tended to be politicized. Since the 1980s, the Labour Party has taken the view that the United Nations and international institutions are more important than bilateral relationships. The Liberal Party, the Liberal, uh, Liberal National Party, the, the equivalent of the Tories in, in, in Australia, have taken the view that multinational, I'm sorry, multilateral and major in, international institutions um, uh, deprive Australia of, of opportunities or of choices, of options. So my great fear is in the last 10 years is that Australia has politicized its attitude toward that part, uh, toward uh, multilateralism. It, it knows that there is a multilateral world. It is part and parcel of it. Australia takes the lead, for example, in nuclear nonproliferation. A founding member of the MPT, the way it was a founding member of the League of Nations and the United Nations. Australia has taken a leading role. At the same time that Australia has taken a leading role in nuclear nonproliferation, it, it goes to bed every night protected by the American nuclear umbrella, like 32 other nations in the world who moan and complain about trade relations, free trade, I never heard of free trade. I heard of trade is about equality of commercial and industrial opportunities. There's been no real free trade, except maybe with our Canadian friends. I don't know if even that's true or not. Uh, so, uh, but uh, Australia has to navigate these things. And I think today, the Australian government, led by Scott Morrison and the Liberal Party, uh, believes that Multilateralism can be sacrificed from time to time. You know, as I say, Australia is a leader in nuclear nonproliferation, and yet it has to explain to people, while well, it wants to get the world down to zero in nuclear weapons, that it, it will not divest itself of its interest in the American protection. So Australia is a little schizophrenic about this. But my fear is that the world is, is taking Donald Trump literally. You know, as I say, he, I, I, I just disagree a little bit with John about there's a, a new world out there. I think it's a recurring cycle in American politics that we come and go. And I tell you, the world does pretty well when we come and go. I mean, America cannot solve everybody's problems. And we have been worried since 1991 about how to find a policy. Now, we don't have a policy. But, and, and even then, we were not instrumental in bringing down Moscow-dominated communism. We were instrumental in ending the arms race. Communism collapsed on its own accord. So Bolshevism lasts 73 years. I mean, you know, we didn't do anything about that. They did it themselves. So I think we can get a little overly worried. Now, it seems to me that the Australians uh, have, have a lesson to tell the world, and that is they have to balance these obligations. What are your multinational, uh, multilateral obligations? And at the same time, what are your bilateral obligations? Will Australia sacrifice one for the other? I think when it comes down to the crunch, Australians would sacrifice uh, a multilateral obligation and favor its obligations with the United States, whether it allows cruise missiles one day in Darwin along with 2,500 Marines and all the rest of it. But the Australian Armed Forces, of course, are interoperable with the American forces, so you know, there's going to be no question about whether it's Beijing or Washington 
They're on the Washington side because of an alliance with the United States allows Australians to be who they want to be in the years, in the, in the future. It's, there's no other arrangement. So they're not going to be looking for any other, any other great and powerful friends. So I, I think we, we have to uh, sort of uh, get a little hold of our courage here. What we are having in the Western world about Donald Trump and about multilateralism is a crisis in confidence. I think we, we've sort of worked ourselves into a state about whether these things survive or not. I'm not worried about treaties or arrangements that survive forever. In the world of diplomacy, which I am an expert, there is no forever. Nothing is going to be forever. Things just reflect things at certain times. You know, we've seen the Treaty of Versailles disappear, the Washington Naval Agreement. In my own lifetime in John's, we've seen Cito and Cento disappear. And yet the world goes on. Funny thing about that, the world continues on. So I think we have to take a more mature approach and be a little less worried about what Donald Trump is doing. Donald Trump may not like multilateralism. And like Richard Nixon, he hated to call Europe. Nixon said he hated to call Europe. But as we know, and as I know from a big study I just published on, on Richard Nixon, he never hung up the phone because there is no alternative to multilateralism, no matter what the president says, whatever the rhetoric is. So we have to peel the rhetoric aside from the actual policies. Uh, a very wise woman once said to me, watch his feet. When John, Donald Trump uh, decries multilateralism, it's usually on the sidelines of a multilateral meeting. He hasn't left these things. And these are important things for him to go to. And I think uh, uh, Donald Trump has, has re-educated Americans about what its interests are. And, Amer and Australia is following suit. They're using this crisis of confidence to realign themselves. But they're not leaving the world. And we're not less safe place. Sure, the world is dangerous and, 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 and uncertain. But I, no more so than it was uh, in, in, 19, uh, in, in 1941. All of Europe lay at the feet of the Nazis between the, the, the gates of, of the Kremlin and the English Channel. There was nothing but German forces. And the swastika flew over all of Europe because Europe had its own crisis of confidence about what to do. Now look, maybe things change, but I, I believe very carefully, very, very strongly in what the, 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 the Admiral told those people on Milos 2,500 years ago, and that the powerful do what they can, and the weak do what they must. And I think the weak do a, a pretty good job of survival and that adaptation. And I think we use these larger organizations to push our own small and middle power agendas, without which I don't think we can do these kinds of things. But the world that we know is not disappearing. It is not going to be replaced by Chinese assertions. It's not going to be replaced by Russian revanchism. We still have a free Asia. And as uh, our good friend uh, Otto von Bismarck used to tell us, you know, we must think a trois. Europe is part of America and is part of free Asia. And so we're not going anywhere in a hurry. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Joe, and thank you very much uh, to all uh, the panelists. If, uh, if you have any immediate reactions to any of what your colleagues say, uh, you can do it now. But if not, I, um, I have a few questions before I pass, uh, pass uh, the floor to our audience. Now, uh, some, of the, um, some of the recurring themes throughout uh, what you have been saying is that uh, multilateralism it has been losing its legitimacy in terms of not delivering perhaps what it promised. This is one thing. And the other is uh, what John explicitly mentioned is uh, what is multilateralism, whether it's a tool or a goal. And I would argue here in Europe, or especially in uh, member European Union states, uh, multilateralism is truly a goal. It's something that uh, is supposed to stabilize Europe. It's something that's supposed to give peace to Europe, right? So the Europeans, I would argue, out of all the regions that we have discussed here, are the most worried about the delegitimization of, of multilateralism because the European Union itself is undergirded by the philosophy of multilateralism. And, and if this is delegitimized, it, the EU uh, might just fall apart, right? Uh, now, but the other theme that we have been hearing here 
both in Australia, which has to balance its bilateral and multilateral interests, both in ASEAN, where the smaller countries are pooling their resources to better balance, uh, whether it's explicitly China or simply just to, to balance uh, itself against the regional powers uh, in Asia. For smaller states and for, stale, for all, basically all individual states within the international system, multilateralism is a tool. It's a tool for the small countries to gain and pool resources uh, to have more power and balance over the bigger states. For the bigger states, uh, it is a tool either to maximize their power or perhaps even to manipulate uh, with the smaller ones. And this is a very realist perspective, uh, perspective of uh, international relations and something that, uh, a perspective that perhaps has been applied throughout the Cold War, right? And after the end of the Cold War, we sort of left this realist perspective and opted for a more liberal or, uh, let's say, uh, 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 liberal institutionalist uh, perspective where multilateralism all of a sudden stopped being considered as a tool but rather a goal. That kind of a perspective which undergirds the European Union should undergird the entire system for, for what some scholars and some politicians opted for. Right? But now we're finding ourselves within, a, uh, 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 within an era where this, uh, this thought of multilateralism as a goal, as a guarantee of, uh, let's say, both stability but also prosperity is somehow being uh, delegitimized. Right? And since we find ourselves uh, uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and perhaps some uh, policy advice uh, might be needed in, set, in this sense, uh, my question to all panelists um, would be, how do we convey the message? And I think Matt's uh, mentioned this and John also, how do we convey it, the message politically uh, to uh, citizens in our countries in order to strengthen uh, their support for multilateralism? How, we, how do we bring back the legitimacy of the idea of multilateralism? And is it even worthy to bring uh, that legitimacy back? Right? Uh, so let's move towards, let's say, a more policy, on the more policy front uh, in terms of how do we bring back uh, the legitimacy of multilateralism if it has been to some extent shattered? And obviously the Trump administration with its political rhetoric, with the politicization, as, as Joe was talking about, of multilateralism, not just in Australia, but we can see it here in the Czech Republic, in the US such, especially from the right-wing parties that focus on national sovereignty, uh, they uh, deliberately attack multilateralism, right? Uh, so, what is the narrative that can tackle this delegitimization of multilateralism? Is there any? Because you know, most of our ministries have some departments of strategic communications or they have some people who focus on strategic communication. So is there a possibility to strategically communicate the virtues of multilateralism to publics in Europe and in other countries that are doubting multilateralism? Anyone? Let me, let me just say that um, I, I think we have to re-educate uh, our children and people at university and in the general public that um, these multilateral organizations came together to solve major problems after major events. We, we, we have to explain to people that when you look at the crisis in global warming, the crisis in global poverty, the crisis, crisis in global migration, the crisis in global nuclear problems, that we have problems that could only be solved in a multilateral way. We have to re-educate the public, which is, and raise the awareness the way these kinds of meetings and other meetings I have attended. I think the public has forgotten a little bit about the world that they live in. They're kind of stuck in that old world. They got pretty comfortable. But we, we're being overrun by a new set of problems. I mean, I read the figures, 65, 70 million people are living in tents. I mean, this is a, a unacceptable and untenable. And global poverty will bring us all down. And global warming certainly will. And global nuclear exchange is fully on the cards. And so we, we have to re-educate the problem about the common problems that can only be solved uh, among nations who come together. Now, and the thing is, they don't have a choice. We either solve these things together 
or as our great friend Benjamin Franklin used to say, we are either going to hang together or we're going to hang one at a time. So I think we've got to hang together on the big problems, but we have to re-educate the public about the problems. I think we have a serious theoretical divide on this panel. There's no hiding the fact that the world order that came out immediately from 1945 was a dreadful place. And I suspect if members of the audience here and everyone was polled, 1945 wasn't actually the best moment in world history when it comes to international relations. Now, multilateralism is embedded with middle class notions of growth and modernization. And in that regard, Yan, I cannot agree with you that we have a problem in relation to Asia. It is in the narrative that if we are to progress, we need multilateralism. How is the Chinese propaganda going to carry on if they don't trade? Uh, you know, that's where I think the Chinese propaganda at home is also schizophrenic, and deliberately so. Uh, at some point, even the most real estate in Asia has to buy into multilateralism because that's the only way you can deliver the goods at home at the same time demonstrate that you've been a great power abroad. And I'll just leave it there. I, I think the challenge is that we're all over the place on this question. And um, I'll add my two bits to it, but I'm not sure how, uh, if it's going to help us move somewhere or not. As I said, we do need to re-engage with our publics, with other players, to get them to see, if we believe in multilateralism, to get them to see the value of multilateralism. Um, at the same time, we have to be looking to have, well, I'll, I'll put it this way. As a diplomat, frequently what you do is you kick the can down the road. When you solve problems, you solve them when no one sees that you've solved the problem because the problem doesn't happen. And in some ways, multilateralism is the same thing. The results aren't there because the problem was nipped early. And so it's very hard to give the message to the public that they'll believe that you actually did something significant. And you know, sometimes kicking the can down the road, which is maybe better than a war at that point or something else, but people see the problem continues to fester. So, I mean, I go back to how I began. Uh, if we believe in multilateralism, we have to reconvince the public of that. And um, if we don't, we're gonna continue to have these questions as to, well, you have all these organizations, they've been working on these causes forever, why don't they ever solve any of them? Um, so I will pick up on the part here is focusing uh, uh, on the, the European integration process. And of course, I would agree to some degree, but over, if we look at the early history of European integration, obviously multilateralism as such was the goal in itself. I agree with that description. Whether the problem with the peace narrative is that you do not necessarily need the European Union as it has become developed today in order to achieve this. There is kind of a relatively big distance because between the fully developed European Union on the one hand and what the broader public would expect that you need in order to guarantee those stable, peaceful relations between the member states. Meaning that perhaps in order, if we look at specifically at the European Union, you probably need something more to provide for the legitimacy of the European Union. And I'm not saying that I have an answer to that. My answer perhaps would be referring back to the issue of choice, but in this case, given that this organization actually is speaking into that many policy fields, the need to be some choice. And from that perspective, if we look at the Brexit process, from my perspective, some mistakes have been done also from the, on the part of the European Union during the negotiations on the withdrawal agreement, which basically has been a bit based on the idea of showing that it's difficult to get good exceptions 
form the general framework of a single market. I will not go into the details there, but there is something about the structure of the negotiations and the content of negotiation first, the withdrawal agreement, which is less favorable here for finding a good solution for the future. And a good solution for the future could be useful for the EU in indication the indicating the, possibility, the possibilities of choice here, that some alternatives to normal membership can be possible. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I see some hands up already uh, with questions, so please, um, now I open the floor uh, to you. Uh, if you would kindly introduce yourself, uh, uh, name the institution you represent here, and formulate your question or comment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Barbara Rakova and I am a representative of the city of Zlin, which is, I'm a member of a municipal level of government. And I'm here because I need to find an answer of what is the role of cities in international policy, which I think there is a role for cities and for the public. And you've just uh, started to discuss that question, which I'm very grateful for, because this is not a usual question. Um, I was wondering whether the solution uh, for this topic, for the public not being at all involved in this topic in multilateralism and international policy, if the solution could be um, a better um, focus on giving and defining roles to multi-level governance, to giving um, a specific role to what cities should do, what regions should do, what governments on national level should do, and then supranational organizations should do. Because then the people would feel there is something they could touch upon on every level, and that could probably be a solution. But that would require some funding for that purpose, some human capital for that purpose, and specific goals for that purpose. And unless that is there, I guess the public will never understand what is going on. I would like to hear your opinions on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so you're talking about, a, let's say, a division of labor on uh, various levels of, of governance, right? That, that is something that could help, uh, let's say, bring more legitimacy to global governance. Is that right? Yes. I yeah. mean, some, yeah. What should politicians and local mm. level do so that public can be more involved? Good. Plus cities as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, so maybe we can collect uh, one or two more answers if there are some. Anyone? I don't see any hands up. So, so we can cover this. And anyone? I'll make a couple comments. Not being a citizen of the European Union, I'm a little bit hesitant, but. Um, in the United States, we normally think you want to put the level of government closest to the people that you can. That doesn't mean everything should be done by a city government, but if it's particular to that city, you want to do it. I think you also, though, have to look at, and this is very much a personal view, how many levels of government you have. And you mentioned the cost of government, and the cost of government is not insignificant. So if you're adding levels, what should some, sh at least you sh should ask the question, do are all the levels needed? And that's probably a long-term question, not a short-term question. Um, because again, you have to look at what the, the levels actually do. Uh, but in order to adequately fund all the levels, can we have you know, just a multitude of levels of government. So I, I think for a city to look at what are the things that you can uniquely do or best do for your citizens? And what are then the things that a region can best do? And the national government, you have some areas in, in Europe that have regional governments and then up to the EU. Um, we, we try in our own way to, to do that but as we all know, most of these now are driven by tradition, much more than they're driven by a real look at what, what are the things that need to be done at what level. Let me just say something about cities. I like cities. Um, my people at my university work on cities a lot. And they have pointed out to me that for the first time in human history, 
the majority of human beings live in cities. So your, your question is perfect. And you know, the best example of what cities can do is what the International Olympic Committee does. When they want an Olympic Games, they make an appeal to everybody at different levels about the environmentally safe part of the games and the, the spirit of comradeship and all the rest of it. So cities do have these roles. I mean, the, the way cities go about solving uh, environmental problems, whether it's separating the garbage or getting rid of straws. I mean, cities set the example for the people within the cities. And you know they 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 are the first responder to producing good global citizens, and so you know you have a responsibility. But I think uh, environmentally, cities can take the lead in a, in a lot of things. So um, that, that's what I would do. And if we're going to educate, re-educate the public about the major issues today, and the issues are just a handful of major issues, I think it has to begin at the city levels and in the schools in the cities. And so it has to be part of your curriculum. You have to bring this awareness to your teachers to, to then pass on to your students. I mean, your students have to know that there's more than this city, this region, this country, that they have global obligations. And if they don't want to think about those things, then we have failed. Thank you. Uh, just very briefly here, a brief comment would be if we look at the global level, of course, when we take the agenda of climate change, for instance, we see increasingly networks of cities being very influential in the work on, when it comes to global governance in that particular, on that particular issue. Uh, so, I mean, it's quite obvious, as was mentioned here by the previous speaker, that the cities have a lot they can do on this global issue. So they are very crucial when it comes to transport, etc., being main contributions to, to CO2 emissions, which are crucial to reduce in that respect. When it comes to, if the question was directly towards the European situation, the European Union? No, in, in general, like in general, what uh, if cities can, for example, because cities, for example, cooperate on the European level in the specific areas that they solve, um, and thus they can better understand that when these topics can be done in cooperation with other cities from other countries, then this can bring it together and then understand better why countries cooperate together. And this is a very good point to make. And of course, the EU has been based on the principle of subsidiarity with the intention of having decision making at the lowest possible level to allow the decision making where it rightly should be. And you have a committee of the regions where you have representatives of the region. Then, of course, and this is perhaps a difficult answer to, a question to answer. And referring to what is actually done to actually make sure that the principle of, principle of subsidiarity is being kept and also that actually you have this exchange of views between cities in Europe. I'm quite sure very small that could be done in retrospect. I'm not, however, an expert on that issue, so a bit of problem of going more into details there. Actually, your, the answers that you seek are already out there in the field called global governance. Uh, if you look at the works by James Rosenau, uh, Benjamin Barber, who came up with the book It May Has Ruled the World in 2014, uh, Thomas Weiss, who's worked a lot on UN global governance issues. It's already there. It's happening. Uh, you realize that in a lot of large nation states, a lot of pseudo foreign affairs authority have been delegated down to the cities. So mayors and city councils have the right to conduct unofficial international relations. Uh, it's happening. Uh, I can share with you the fact that uh, Singapore and provincial cities in China are carrying out this sh sharing of good practices in public administration. Whether the Chinese have actually mastered Singapore's operating principles is of course a matter of subjectivity, but there are master's courses conducted in my university dedicated to mayors of Chinese cities. Now, another illustration from my part of the world uh, those of you who have travelled to London and have lamented the fact that there's congestion charging in central London, the idea came from Singapore. All right? Nothing to do with government-to-government -government cooperation. It's just that at that point in time, Mayor Ken Livingston came to Singapore and he said, what a wonderful idea, I'll take it home. That's all. That's how he solved it. So the air in central London is a lot cleaner than in the suburbs, even on heavy traffic days. Thank you. Okay, do we have some... We have five more minutes left. Do we have uh, another question over there? Thank you. 
Yes. Um, yeah, I have, I have one comment, and uh, I have one comment which has uh, something to do maybe with some of the, the speeches we've heard right now. Uh, I represent, I'm Irina Krasnitska, I represent the uh, OSCE, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is an example per se, is history, is an example how multilateralism can be, can be successful. Uh, because it helped to end the second, uh, the the, uh, the Cold War, of course. And um, uh, for me, uh, what is in, uh, important is to see, <clears throat> uh, on on one side, are the instruments of the organization or of the multilateralism as such, and on the other hand, is the political will of particular states. And uh, the the what is uh, the, the multilateralism works. When, these and when there is a political will to use these instruments, and when you, have, you see a purpose for using those instruments. This can change in time, and uh, uh, what I like about the organization I represent is the fact that it has instruments for uh, all the phases of the, of the crisis cycle, from early warning until the, the, the reconciliation phase, and um, the fact is that once the window of opportunity, we'd say, of political will is there, uh, it can react very quickly, and we can see it. But on the other hand, of course, as it is a, a consensus and, and, and totally inclusive organization, it's not so, uh, I mean, you really have to have a political will on all the sides. So uh, it's also the question whether to use uh, bilateral or multilateral, but this is the uh, the, the strengths and also uh, I would say that the problems of multilateralism are, are are very nicely to be seen on the organization I I represent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions? If not, uh, I would like to use what you, uh, you, you said here. I, I think you formulated it uh, very pertinently in in uh, terms of. Um, the notion of political will and the political will uh, of our representatives to reach uh, reach out to multilateral organizations to solve the issues and basically uh, this is uh, also something that has been discussed uh, on this panel and maybe uh, for uh, my last question and uh, using the opportunity that we have John Cloud here who's if I'm not mistaken also served during the Reagan administration right in, in US Foreign Service uh, we have Joe who was born in Chicago uh, and so uh, my, my question is here, and we're talking about the cycles. Joe, Joe mentioned the cycles of, of U.S. foreign policy and uh, either trying to go bilateral or multilateral, and that these are cycles. The Reagan administration was very much similar in its approach to the Trump, uh, to multilateralism as the Trump administration. So maybe the question, uh, a little bit forward-looking, would be, uh, is the Trump administration in the end the same thing as the Reagan administration in terms of its approach to multilateralism. And the other thing is, is this a cycle? Will the next presidency, whether it's a Republican one or a Democratic one, revert back to an embrace of multilateralism just like the Obama administration admitted to do? Or is this a longer term trend where really the, let's say, the politicization, the delegitimization of multilateralism in the American public is so strong that simply uh, multilateralism is dying out in uh, American foreign politics. Thanks. I, I don't think we're going to have a, a reversal of politics with the next election. It might even be Trump 2.0. If it's not Trump, it'll be somebody else. By the way, I don't think he's going to last forever with all this pressure on him. And, and so it, it's a cycle. These are usually 20 to 25 year cycles. And it's when Americans see the world, um, they try to avoid it as much as they can. And then they jump in. They want to control everything. And then they back off again. And we've suffered cultural blindness on a number of occasions, Afghanistan, Iraq, and the Vietnam War, and all the rest of it. And so there's a learning process. I don't care if, if people want to leave an organization. Isn't it ironic that Donald Trump, who has a worldwide reputation for being anti-multilateral, 
has bothered to go to the United Nations this week to tell everyone he doesn't like to be multilateral. I mean, the, the, the irony here is just dripping all over the place. So, uh, you know, as, as my first wife used to say, watch his feet, not his mouth, okay? Just watch where he is and what he's doing. And, and I just let, let me add here, too, that this president it drives most of us crazy from time to time because we're trying to tease out what he means every morning. He's got the world leaders on speed dial. So it's not like he's not talking to anybody. Americans tried isolationism in the 1930s. It didn't work. We're never going back there. It's, there'll be some variation of post-isolationism. And so we, we don't have any choice. We can't go back there. But I, I, I think the, there are sinews, there are muscles that have been created. So there's no INF treaty. Well, no one's installing cruise or Pershing missiles. It's not going to happen. America doesn't belong to the comprehensive tre uh, uh, nuclear test ban treaty, but it doesn't have any nuclear tests. You see my point. We, we, there's a lot of good habits out there, a lot of muscle habits that we picked up over the years that we're not going to return there. So I, I think we're not in as bad a place uh, as, as some people think. As, what we have to do is double down and ask ourselves, do, do we trust these people? And as I say, when America, when Europeans and Asians go to bed at night, America is responsible for the, the nuclear response. That's why America may quibble about trade. Even Australia may quibble about trade. But I think the security arrangements are carved in stone until, until nuclear weapons become anachronistic. You know, that's what I like about nuclear deals. They don't last forever, but they buy us a little bit of time. And we need the time. And let me tell you about multilateralism. If that water rises by three meters, we're going to start in the United Nations and every multilateral organization in the world about solving the problem. We're not going to escape what's coming next. So people who don't think we're part of the world, you know, either going to have to get a canoe and a paddle and go the other way or join the larger group because we're not going to be able to solve these problems alone. Thank you. Uh, I'll pick up a little bit on climate change. It's one I usually try to avoid in Europe for good reasons. But um, we used to have this thing called Kyoto, and George W. Bush pulled us out of Kyoto um, for a couple of reasons that were not unreasonable. Um, but he then immediately went to a major program of trying to move to the hydrogen economy because that would be an economy that did not release greenhouse gases. Now, President Obama then slowed down that work because he wanted to do things more multinationally. I'm sorry he slowed down the work. I'm not so sorry that he did things multilaterally. Um, picking up a little bit of what Joe said, we're going to look for pragmatic solutions. We're sometimes not going to buy the rhetoric, but you know, there is a huge debate going on in the United States right now on climate change that is based upon people seeing the practical results of climate change. That may not affect our political debate, but it does affect, and we had the question here about cities, it does affect our states who are now engaging in a lot of the international discussions of climate change, some of our states. Um, and so it's a very dynamic situation. If you just look at one level, you're not going to see everything that's happening. Um, and we'll, we'll find how it goes. Um, you know, the, the debate that you're having in Europe or you've already had in Europe and resolved, you know, that debate, that discussion is happening. The marches are happening today in Washington. I think Washington was shut down this morning by the young people marching on climate change. The last time I looked at the Washington Post, they talked about the streets being, you know, being very fulfilled. Um, you know, it's, we have some younger people in the room. I am far from that category. Uh, but it's wonderful to see people are getting out and exercising their democratic rights to make sure they have, a, they have an earth to live in. So, um, you know, we will, you know, I tried to make the point the U.S. will look and try to find pragmatic solutions, and that's where I think we'll be. Sometimes we won't buy the rhetoric. Look at what we're doing, though. 
not just what we're saying. And on groups like the OICE, which has done phenomenal work in this part of the world, but now even more eastward from here, um, you know, most of those groups are below, you know, uh, below the water. Nobody sees them. They're still funded. People are still happy with them. Occasionally, they, they rise above because of some crisis in the world, and we're all very happy we have that institution in place to try to solve the problem. So I, I thank you for your work. Okay, thank you, thank you, John. Uh, Joe, unless uh, Matt and Alan have a quick comment, uh, we are out of time. Uh, okay. So uh, please uh, join me in a round of applause for the panelists. I would also like to thank you for coming. And please uh, enjoy the rest of this day. And uh, please come tomorrow for the second day of the symposium for some more interesting panels. And you will see also uh, our, our panelists uh, on other panels tomorrow. So thank you very much.